uh, I will introduce our speaker for tonight. Should be a very interesting topic. Our speaker for tonight is Jay Cobell. He is uh, Ryan's brother-in-law, and he's a Civil War reenactor. And he is going to give a very interesting topic tonight on the snipers and sharpshooters of the Civil War. So with that, uh, I welcome Jay. <clears throat> Thank you. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here, and um, thank you very much for asking me. Um, this is a subject that's kind of near and dear to my heart, history of all forms um, has been something that's touched me. I'm a little nervous here. Um, and there's a big reason in my life why history is so important, and uh, there's a few out here. I'd like teachers to raise their hand this evening. Thank you, thank you. Ah, Greg, that, that means you too, <laughs> my mentor. Uh, Greg Goodchild. I had a, a, a wonderful set of teachers in my life that funneled me towards history. They didn't teach me how to think, but they taught me where to look and form my own opinions. Therefore, history became something that was almost larger than life. I could go anywhere in the world and all I needed to do was read a book. I could find out anything I wanted to know. One of the parting gifts I took from one of the greatest history teachers I ever had told me that people who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So therefore, history became something of all kinds that I like to learn. I have, um, you can ask Ryan, he kind of laughs at me because I go off on tangents. I, I've gone from this to Gurkhas and what they meant in history and how they got started and everything. And, and when we go places, Ryan has a, a wonderful ear to listen and he goes, why do you get off on these tangents? And I, I don't know, it's just a thing. So anyway, with that out of the way, thank you very much, we'll get started. Um, for Honor and Would Leave No Trail is almost a true statement. They were almost shadows in the dark with what they did. We'll find out here pretty soon that there were actually two, two different groups for my, my focus was more on the Confederacy than it was with uh, Burdan. Burdan's group, uh, his sharpshooters had the best of everything that the Union could offer. Clothing, materials, weaponry, they had it all. Um, and, and you can, it, it's not proven. And the, the term tree frogs was one of the things that um, historically I can't document that that's what it was. I don't know if that was a reenactor's term or, or whatever, but I do know that that Verdan's bunch have been referred to as that because somewhere along the line, those guys were always hanging out in trees somewhere. Uh, <laughs> And they were dressed in green, so you can take from that what you want. You might know what a sharpshooter is, but do you know where the name came from? Anybody want to take a guess? Uh, they did have sharps, but no. This started out as people in their units going, this guy is a real sharpshooter. He shoots really sharp. They were shooting at targets far and above what the ordinary person could get. So that's where the term sharp shooter was developed. They uh, carried that through life with them as they went through all the wars. They, these guys are separate and set apart. They're, they're special. Um, they're not your average run of the mill soldier as we're gonna find out. The qualifications to be a sharpshooter, they had to be able to read and draw maps. I'm not used to the modern technology. They had to be able to read and draw maps. Everything that they did was communicated to them, either in writing, to and from the commanding field general. They didn't take orders from anybody else. When they were sent out, they did surveillance. They drew maps of who was where, what was where, they would bring it back with them. 
they also had to have an outstanding ability to do math. And they go, why did they have to do math? When you start making these long shots, you'll understand why the things that come into play that they had to be able to do in order to make some of the shots that they shot. <laughs> Judging distance was one of the first things when you became a sharpshooter that you were to do. They would take you out and they would stand people at 100 yards, at 150 yards, at 200 yards, up to 400 yards away, people would stand there and you had to be able, before you ever fired the rifle, you had to be able to tell them roughly at what distance within a couple of feet of what they were standing. This was a drill that was done over and over and over and over so that the judgment of distance that they had, if they thought something was 600 yards out, by today's standards, if we measured it, these guys could tell you that it was probably right at 600 yards. They had an eye. It was developed. It was trained. It was not, you know, I think. No, it was they knew. And that was because of the repeated doing it over and over and over. They also had to be able to mark their weapon. And the weapons that they marked, the target was a seven foot square with a four foot red circle in it and it was placed at 400 yards. You ever stood in Lambeau Field at the end zone and looked at the goal post at the other end 100 yards away? It's kind of small, isn't it? Could you imagine with open sights at 400 yards, you're shooting at a target that's about this big and to mark out, you have to put three rounds in the red circle, no more than an inch and a half apart. There can't be any, any more than that much space between them. If you didn't, you failed, and you went back and you started all over again. This was, they, they took this stuff very, very seriously. These guys were kind of like the, the big game hunters. They found out early in the Confederacy that the deer hunters and uh, the guys that put meat on the table through the, the southern states, Tennessee, Kentucky, Alabama, those guys were real sharpshooters. They had to, you know. They were also one shot, one kill. You couldn't have, you know, waste your powder and stuff. You had to put meat on the table. These guys were the ones that they were were looking for and they're the ones that they stepped up first and brought into the program when they started this. It was, um, it was kind of a necessity for them. They, the, as, as time went on, they fulfilled another, you know, other duties. But distance right now was, was what they were looking at. When they started on these, in order for them to tell they were firing from here. They had a berm. There was a guy down there with a flag. When he hit it, they'd raise a the flag. They had a, a gentleman with a spotting scope over here that would look and tell him roughly where he hit the target so that he knew where to put the next round. It was, it was not, not science at all. It was just everything was on his shoulders. And most of those rifles, were incredibly heavy and they would rest on a, a, a post that they had designed just for them to do and hold the weight of that rifle because if you're trying to hold that and the thing's moving, it's not going to work at all when you're shooting those kinds of distances. Life in camp. If they were lucky enough to be in camp, they would eat with the guys they would socialize with them. But again, they were exempt from camp duties. Their job was to go over to do nothing but put rounds down range. They were to do nothing but take their orders from the commanding field general. Say he wants to interrogate a couple of war prisoners. They would send these guys out. They would capture opposing forces and they would bring them back for interrogation. 
they became the special forces of the Confederacy and some of the special forces that we see today, that was kind of the birthplace of how this all kind of, of transpired. They were, um, they were a, a strange, strange bunch on both sides, Union and Confederate. They were both, they were both strange. This, uh, this is kind of what life was for them. They traveled light. They made friends with the farmers and stuff around when they were, were looking and, and making their reports. Uh, most of them ate pretty well, probably much better than they did in the, in the camps at that time because they were on their own and they had to forage and would gather whatever they could. Um, that's that's kind of like life in a camp for them. There was not a, uh, a daily routine. If they were in the camp, that particular unit would drill, they would shoot, 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 and that was, that was their life. The sharpshooter's equipment, the Union was different than the Confederacy, haversacks, uh, some of the cartridge boxes and stuff were different. Uh, they had maps, paper, pencil. They had to be able to read and write because of the reports that they would send back or take back with them. A lot of them carried a Bowie knife in the event that they were caught or had to do hand-to-hand -hand combat because part of their training was actual hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, some of the techniques that the Confederates adopted after things got rolling uh, were based upon the Zouave. The Zouave were, were soldiers that had an excellent kind of military strategies and stuff and a lot of the a lot of the hand-to-hand -hand combat and stuff came from some of the things that developed off of the history that they had. Um, but as you can see, they traveled pretty light. There was no, there was no guild in the lily. They, they had it all. Uh, and they lived off of what they had with them. And their wits was probably the, the primary thing that they used the most. The most popular weapon for the Confederate soldier was the two-band infield right here. And these are the slugs. Those are uh, 58 caliber. That was the most reliable and dependable weapon that a Confederate sharpshooter could have. That's considered right there to be a thousand yard rifle. Now, I'm going to ask the question who knows the difference between a rifle and a musket? What's the difference? Anybody? Rifle has rifling, right? Musket is a smooth bore. Correct. I had to, had to ask because the little kids that I talk to, they don't know the difference, and we try to teach them, you know, what it is. The infield was the weapon of choice if they could get it. There are others that are coming up. Uh, I'll, I'll throw this in, too. A lot of the Confederate soldiers had their own weapons that they brought with them because they didn't have the resources that the North had. If they took their target rifles that they brought from home or their hunting rifles that they brought from home, they would have to mark them and then they were issued a letter from their commanding officer that they could carry that and they had to keep that on their person to carry that rifle in order to use it in the war. They found out later <laughs> that the fine German and Italian made hunting rifles didn't hold up to the battlefield conditions because of the harshness they would break. They were, you know, delicate. The target rifles were incredibly accurate. They were also incredibly heavy. So, you know, there were drawbacks. This was their, this was their go-to. Everybody talks about the Whitworth. This is what it looks like. If you notice, 
Whitworth's claim to fame, hexagonal bore, had a scope on the side of it. Here's the bullets. The Whitworth, this is the infield that we just looked at. This is the bore, and this is the hexagonal bore for the Whitworth. The Whitworth rifle has made 1,200 yard lethal shots in the Civil War. It was a bear to load. You almost had to screw this bullet down into the barrel, whereas the infield slides right down in. This was almost screwed in. The other, the other bad part about the Whitworth was the grade of powder that they had to use. If you didn't have the English powder that came with it, it would foul much faster by using the stuff that the Confederacy had, the black powder. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to foul anyway because uh, I, I did some research and, and there were a couple of guys that were talking. They both happened to be sharpshooters for the military. And I read the, I read the article. It was very interesting that uh, with their 50 caliber technology and, and the sharps that, that there was no way that Whitworth could make those kinds of shots, right? Two guys equally matched. One took a modern day 50 cal. The other one took the Whitworth. They went out to the range, and the Whitworth, true to form, after the third shot, fouled, wouldn't fire. They were doing five rounds. But when all was said and done, at 1,200 yards, the 50 cal versus the Whitworth, that Whitworth, there was only two degrees difference in the final targets between today's modern 50 caliber and what that black powder rifle could put out. The only problem was, it took him forever to get those five shots off, but they were still just as dead on and accurate as today's technology. And we're talking 1,200 yards. That's quite a distance. Whoop, wrong button. These are some rare examples of 45 caliber Whitworth. Uh, they're sharpshooter bullets. Um, they were used in certain areas there's, they were more expensive, but they were super accurate, and um, they didn't, they didn't drop. The, uh, the rounds, these were dug up at Gettysburg, um, and when they were loaded, they were, a fa as you can see, they were a faster load because they weren't twisted in. Whitworth, uh, People go, oh, I bought an original Whitworth rifle, did you? Because one of Whitworth's claim to fame were when they made their barrels, they made them eight inches longer than the rifle itself, and they would cut that off. And that was the actual mold for the bore for that barrel for that rifle. So when you, when you bought an original Whitworth, you had the bullet mold that matched the bore of that rifle. So there was, and then this came about so that they could modify them and use them and get them to, to go a little faster. And these were more accurate than the other ones, but they were expensive to make. The Kerr target rifle, we were talking about target rifles. All the units, and this was, uh, um, being sent out to take out a target that was almost unseeable by the human eye. We're talking 12, 1400 yards. This rifle is small bore, it's 45 caliber. Um, the, they used the English made them as, as target rifles, but as you can see, it was a paper cartridge bullet. When it was loaded, the back was cut, the primer goes on, and it fires, much like the sharps that you were talking about that came later, and that's what gave Berdan the final edge on things was the, that sharps rifle, the drop block breech. 
uh, <laughs> Sedwig at the battle, he said that, that you couldn't hit an elephant at that distance. This is in the museum. It's a Whitworth sniper rifle. That's his final words that he uttered before that round hit him and took him out. So they do, they do uh, shoot a long distance. Uh, very popular uh, amongst Colorado. This is another target rifle. This would be an example of somebody that was a sharpshooter. They brought their own. They would put this back together. They would qualify. So they would then keep it in the box so that all, all the equipment that goes with that rifle is there. He would bring, actually he would probably have two. He would have this one and they would probably have the infield. The infield would be the regular skirmishing rifle. This would be brought out when they were going after a specific target that they were told to get that was in a great distance. Uh, and since we're speaking about great distances, uh, we got any pilots in the room? Anybody fly a plane? Sharpshooters had to come up with a thing they didn't understand besides, this is where the math comes into play. Windage, elevation, okay, distance. The other thing was called the Corliss effect. Every pilot can tell you what the Corliss effect is. Once I fire a round from this rifle and I send it down range, I'm standing in line with the target, but because of the rotation of the earth, the target is moving away. So depending upon the speed of that bullet, the distance and the elevation I have to have because I can't shoot this in a straight line, it won't go that far. I have to shoot it up and drop it down on my target these guys had to do mathematical calculations in their head of how far they wanted to move to the left or to the right and up or down, and they had to judge for wind speed all at the same time before they pulled that trigger so they knew whether they were going to make that shot or not. <coughs> same holds true today. You can take the most modern advanced sniper rifle. You can take a Lapua. You can take a 338 Lapua. And they still have to make those same calculations today in order to make those long distance shots. These guys didn't just step up and pull the trigger. They really had to think and know what they were doing before they sent that bullet down range. Otherwise, they'd miss their target. And then they've done something worse. They've disclosed where they are because when these go off, there's a big puff of smoke that comes out. And even at 400 yards, if you've got some good gunners that are standing up there, they're going to see that puff of smoke, and they're just going to know somebody's in that tree line. They're going to know where you are. So most of the time, they were hit and run. They would shoot, and they would move on. This supposedly, and it's, it's later proven to be false, but this, this supposedly made the longest kill shot in the Civil War. And I'm not even sure what make or model it is. I just, when I was reading it, and this is what Ryan and I were talking about. So many things that you read, and what I'm trying to give you today are the facts and, and the research to prove what's there. Can I be wrong? Of course I can. Some of it is up to interpretation, how you look and interpret things. Some of it is fact. It is what it is. Um, but when these disclaimers come out and, and you find these things, then you have to begin to wonder. So I kind of use a rule of thumb. I try to find three separate sources before I include it. That way, if I have three different sources to verify the one thought that I have, I'm pretty sure that it's, it's accurate and true. Um, can I be wrong? Oh, you bet. Every day. They bring new stuff to the table and, and people see things and, and it's like, wow. Okay.
the Berdan began recruiting men for the 1st Sharpshooter Regiment in 1861. He recruited men from New York and the city of Albany, from, you know, from the state of New York, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Wisconsin. The volunteers recruited had to pass a rifle test. That's the stuff that we talked about earlier, okay? In order to qualify to be a member of sharpshooters, each man had to be able to place 10 shots in a circle of 10 inches from 200 yards away. This is a scope. Most of them were doing it with open sights. Not everybody had the leisure of a scope. Those rifles with the scopes, those came out for 1,000, 1,200 yard shots. Those, those were kept under lock and key. They didn't see the light of day unless they had a viable target that they were going to use. Captain Edward Drew, Company G. Uh, organized and recruited in Wisconsin under the supervision of General William L. Utley. Uh, he was also a noted marksman and was crucial to the expedited process of organizing and mustering Wisconsin's volunteer regiment. On September 19, 1861, the unit moved out from Camp Randall to rendezvous with the United States Sharpshooters and were officially mustered into the Federal Service on September the 23rd, 1861 in New York City. Uh, this was the act of the War Department. The first and second United States Sharpshooters were mustered into the regular Army and were no longer volunteers. Company G's first sharpshooter is sometimes unofficially re referred to as the first Wisconsin sharpshooters. Company G fought in the battles of uh, Chancellorsville, Gettysburg, Hanover Court House, um, Wilderness, Marvel Hill, Cold Harbor, Bull Run. Uh, they were in the thick of all of it. You can find enough information on Verdan and the Union forces to fill this room. When you start looking for the Confederate stuff, you have to remember one thing. To be a sharpshooter in the Confederate Army was not an honorable thing. We're still talking about a time where people in the South settled their disputes with dueling pistols. If I have an accuser, I confront him face to face. I don't stand three or four hundred yards away and shoot him. That was sought as cowardice. A lot of the information about the Confederate sharpshooters was destroyed because the families didn't want to talk about it. It wasn't an honorable thing. They did not want to put it out there. There's more coming to light. As the families get older, the kids find the stuff, it gets into the hands of historians. But it was not an honorable thing at that time to be one of these guys. This is the uniform. And actually, at one point in time, Union and Confederate both had green. The green uniform for a sharpshooter for the Confederacy is very rare, but they did exist, and they do exist today if you can find them. Somebody, who asked me who the greatest sniper? Okay, we're going to get on on this one now. This will, this will give you a whole lot of controversy, but you should read the book. The greatest sniper of the Civil War was neither Union nor Confederate. It was this guy right here, Jack Henson, a tobacco farmer. He lived in the land between the lakes, between Tennessee, Kentucky, all down in through there in the rivers, okay? Jack Henson, historically, had both Union and Confederate forces in his home trying to broker a deal so that there really wasn't a war. So the story goes. Now, the man that wrote the book about him 
was a retired lieutenant colonel. The book has credibility. Jack Henson got drug into the war. The, the name of the book is Jack Henson, One Man's Personal War. Jack got drug into the war because his kids were taken as snipers by Union forces. They were beheaded and the officers of the day brought the bodies and placed the heads on his fence post at his home because they were supposedly snipers. There was no trial, there was no nothing. They were executed right there. They wanted to get rid of Henson in the worst way possible. He actually, if the story is true, and I believe there's a lot of credibility to it, whether, you know, whether it was gilded or not as it was told, that's up to whoever. Um, he became so outraged, this particular part of the world was great in ironworks. They made a lot of iron down there. This rifle right here, I have seen in a museum. It has 32 little circles that he took a punch and punched on the top of it. He has over 100 confirmed kills. Most of them were all officers. He had etiquette about himself. If there was somebody that was wounded, he would stop shooting for the medical teams to come out and attend to the wounded. Officers didn't fare so well. They usually didn't just get wounded. They were usually taken out. He had a, a passion for revenge. In fact, he hired a German gun maker in the area, said, make me this weapon. Gave him the specs, and he told the German gunsmith, he said, the very ground that soaked up my son's blood will issue their demise back to them. That rifle, believe it or not, would fire 100 grains of black powder at 50 caliber. That makes it supersonic when it was released. That thing was, it's, it's a beast. It is incredibly heavy. You know, I never, I, of course it was encased, I couldn't pick it up, but just, the barrel on it alone is almost two inches around. It's, it's, it's a monster. Uh, and it was a true rifle. It did have lands and grooves in it. It was not a, you know, it wasn't a smooth bore. And it was 50 caliber. Uh, interesting story. Read it for yourself and see what you think. Truth or fiction? There's truth to it. Whether it's 100% accurate, it's anybody's guess, but I can tell you he was an interesting man. And there's a twist at the end of the story. Seems the apple doesn't far fall from the tree. Make sure you read all the last pages because his grandson follows in grandpa's footsteps. And I'll just leave it at that. It's, it's, I don't want to be a spoiler. It's a very interesting story. So to answer your question, Greg, the greatest sniper of the Confederacy would say it was him. And he never did join either side. There was no, there's no documentation. They did see him wearing some Union clothes, or wearing some Confederate clothes at one time. They don't know if that was for cover. They don't know if it was because his other stuff had been destroyed. You know, they really, the historians can't say. Um, the, the story is as factual, I think, as, as they could make the stuff about him, you know, from the family records and stuff of the day. Remember I told you there were two types? There were the snipers, sharpshooters, and then there's these guys. <laughs> these guys were what the sharpshooters turned out to be, the shock troops. These guys were the elite of the elite. They would be used to not only start skirmishes, 
but they would be used to end them as forces would retreat. These guys would go in, they would be, let me see if I got this right, Ryan. They, these were the line in front of the line. These were the guys that they would start the battle. They would flank to the sides. Everybody would come up through. And then when they'd had enough, they would retreat. These guys would fall back and give cover so everybody could escape. It was said in one of the uh, diaries that I found, it was said that these guys carried the smell of death about them because they were just not, I guess they weren't the friendliest bunch in the world, but if you're getting shot at all the time, I can understand why you wouldn't be. These guys were the real deal. This group <coughs> is what started the beginning of the United States towards the snipers and the special forces that we have today. And if you were really good as a sharpshooter, as the war went on, this was your lot in life. They would send you here. It's believed that uh, he was shot by a Confederate sharpshooter near the second Wisconsin infantry. The theory is based upon a downward angle of the bullet and entry, i.e. in a tree. There's no way to prove, but you do see drawings, and most of them are Berdan's bunch, of them being in trees. And they would actually take ropes and tie themselves to the tree so that they wouldn't move when they were waiting to make that shot. This is <laughs> I can't tell you it's 100% guaranteed for real. I can tell you that the paper that it was found with gave the history of where it was taken from. I do know that this mark right here is of a sharpshooter. All of the stuff the Confederacy had is almost non-existent as far as the patches. There are a few that are out there that they can confirm. A lot of it, these guys didn't have uniforms. In several of the drawings, when you look at the Tennessee, the Alabama, the Kentuckys, these guys, some of them are dressed in the wool gray. Other ones are dressed in gray wool pants and they have their buckskin shirts on. There was no uniformity at all. And part of that was because of money. The other part of it was these guys were kind of rebellious against anything and everything. They were there to do a job. And that was kind of their mindset. This patch right here, the second Maryland sharpshooters, it's a blue circle. It's actually an octagon with a red Roman cross in the center of it. McCombs, McCombs Brigade in Tennessee and Maryland. This particular patch right here is the one that's in the Library of Congress. It's one of the only true examples left of the Confederate sharpshooters. Now, with that being said, of course, this is put on a display for the clothing. They had a specific way these things had to be attached to the uniform because if you were caught, yep, this is another one. If you were caught with this stuff on your uniform by Union forces, you didn't go to prison, they hung you. They hung all sharpshooters, no question about it. If you had the markings on you, you were done. So in order to fasten them to the uniform, 
there were two pins. There was a pin on each, the top and bottom. That would hold the patch on. The red stripe for the sniper, which came later, went across the back of the arm, across the elbow to the forearm. That was held on with four stitches. In the event you were overrun and caught, those were ripped off. The heel digs a hole in the dirt. You throw them in the dirt. You cover it up. Now you're, now you're an ordinary soldier. No questions asked. But if you got caught with those things on, you were done. There was no, no go set in the jail. The battalion was made up of three companies, first, second, and third, each having about 55 men. 165 total, the battalion was organized in March of 1864. The patches that you see displayed here were a badge consisting of a, a red band running across the left elbow and coat and sleeve to the wrist with a red star just above. These were the sharpshooters. This badge would pass the sharpshooter. If I'm standing at a gate, and I'm running guard. And one of these guys walk up and he's marked like this, I don't even talk to him. He's got a free pass. He goes on. These guys were full of information. They were full of knowledge. And they basically were used the wrong way. And I always make the joke, had they been used the right way, we'd be flying under a different flag right now than we are. Uh, this, this is an interesting, and it, it gets muddy sometimes when you start researching this stuff out because what's true, what's false. Murfreesboro, it was a clue, and uh, the drizzle, they have, uh, These guys were kept in the trenches. And as you see in the drawing, there's a tree branch, there's the trees. All he's missing is the rope tied around the tree. This is the sharpshooter's medal. <clears throat> this is an actual original one that was issued to the sharpshooters. They're very rare, hard to find. So if you happen to look up on one of those in original shape, that's, that's all the better. <laughs> Sir. Question. Yep. You said the uh, southern sharpshooters were hanged by I I don't know. I never looked into that. I do know that not too many of Berdan's people were ever taken. And, and I would assume because of some of the civility that um, the Southern gentlemen had, they would have kind of held them maybe and held off. Um, there, were, there were actual documents signed by commanding officers of Union forces that you catch a sniper, you hang him right there. You don't ask any questions and turn him loose. Uh, Berdan's folks and, and Berdan's bunch themselves were a little bit above. They started out at the ground at the shock troop level because of the equipment and some of the training and stuff that they had. It took the Confederacy a little bit to catch up, then the shock troop came, but Berdan had that much time to build and that much more money to add to his coffers. But yeah, I imagine they would be tried and hung as well, but it was not quite as, as dramatic as what the Union had done with the, the Confederate guys because um, they just had an extreme dis dislike for these fellas. One of the things I do know is that, um, anybody want to take a guess at what the most highly traded commodities were between North and South 
when they weren't fighting and shooting at each other? Huh? Coffee and tobacco, right. I've read more accounts of North and South stopping, going out with white flags, trading supplies, <laughs> and going back. And I mean, it was, it, it, the, obviously, these gentlemen really didn't hate each other. They just got to a point where they had to do what they had to do. They were, you know, I mean, the, the, if you can stop a war and trade coffee and tobacco and go back and smoke your cigarettes and have a cup of coffee on both sides, that tells me that maybe there's room at the bargaining table to make things calm down and, and stop this. Um, anybody want to take a, a guess on what the leading cause of death was during the Civil War? Anybody know? Dysentery. Correct. Yeah. More soldiers on both sides died of dysentery than they did uh, gunshot wounds. And the gunshot wounds were usually pretty nasty when they got hit. So, um, hence the practice that, that doctors got into today. A lot, of, a lot of the stuff that we have today came out of the Civil War for them trying to save lives. A lot of the medical practices on gunshot wounds and, and all of this stuff, those were all documented cases from doctors that were carried on, that were looked at, what can we do better, how can we do more. All of this stuff was all because of what the people in this room want to keep active and alive, which is a Civil War. Greg. Correct. Correct. Sir? When did the term sniper develop? That was after, that would have been after the Civil War. They kept some of these guys around because they needed special, the, the United States, after they got back together, realized that between what Berdan had and what the Confederates had, they needed a, quote, special force a special mobile force that they could take and do things with. So these guys that were sharpshooters, then at that point from the shock troop, after the, after the formation of the shock troop, then the term sniper became, but that was after the Civil War because they were then set out to snipe specific targets, not like these guys were sent out to protect the lines and start and end the skirmishes. So there was, I mean, the, the sharpshooter was always there. The sniper became part of the terminology afterwards. In order to be one, a sharpshooter first, then you went and became a sniper. There was no you could, you had to do one before you could do the other. And as you could see, the qualifications for Berdan were very similar to what the Confederacy had for their guys. Uh, I will tell you this, though. Distance, judging, and the math that they have to do in order to make the calculations is what made a good sharpshooter great. That was that was Henson's, because he shot 500 grain or he shot 100 grains of black powder. Great, but, but that, are you saying then that none of the other Civil War weapons were supersonic? They were all subsonic in speed. I don't know that that's ever been clocked, but I would, huh? I don't think I don't think it is. I don't think it is, and that's why, with when he was firing such a small projectile, 50 caliber ball, 
is not very big. And it, with 100 grains of black powder behind it coming out of that rifle, that's really got to be moving when it's coming out of there. The intensity here. Right. And he, Henson, if you read the book, Henson would set up on a ledge on the river and wait for these barge captains, Union barge captains, to step out on the deck and he'd drop them before they heard the report. And he was so high up that their deck guns couldn't reach him because he was way up here. And when they volleyed their guns, they were shooting this far underneath him. So, yeah, it's it, the story itself is is very interesting. Uh, to me, after after looking and reading everything that that I have. The two-band infield was the most popular. Uh, everybody talks about the, the Whitworth and the Kerr being, they were there, but they were held for specific, special uses. They weren't, you know, it's kind of like uh, um, when I was a kid at home, we had the company dishes, you know? We didn't eat off the normal paper plates that we always did, we had the company dishes. That it's the same concept. Your 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 uh, infield was the company, or not the company dishes. The infield was the paper plates that everybody always ate off of. The Kerr and the uh, the Whitworth were the company dishes. That was brought out, and there were only certain people that they would issue that rifle to to go after whatever that target was that they wanted. Uh, and then after they were done, it was brought back and it was locked up for the next use because A, they were expensive, B, they were incredibly heavy, and C, there weren't that many of them. So it's, you know, that was one of those things that, that, that if you're going to drive the Mercedes, you're only going to drive it around the block just to say that you drove, but you're not. <laughs> yes, sir. There were, but I don't know that, that the term applied to them. They were used in that capacity. You know, I, I mean, you can look in, in uh, the Zouaves and, and all the way through uh, English history, British history, uh, all the way down the line. There have been, I'll use the term superior marksmen in all of them, they've all been called something different, but they always existed. They seemed to come to the top when they were needed, and they were used to fulfill the need that was was there. Uh, it's kind of like you you don't send a watchmaker when you need a blacksmith, and these guys these guys were. Uh, and they were watched. I mean, they were, they really were watched. They were looked upon as special. And they were in a lot of ways. They did have special talents. They were incredibly intelligent. Uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but I don't think I'd want to spend 14 days out in the field drawing maps and, and, and trailing a set of Union forces and having chipmunks run over my head because I'm laying in the ground trying to watch and count, you know, how many cannoneers they got and wondering where my next meal is going to come from because, I mean, I've grown accustomed to sleeping in my cot and doing a few of these things. But these guys, I mean, they, a lot of them really ate it up. The big thing, though, was that the Southern families, if you were a sharpshooter, the Southern families did not like it. It wasn't talked about. It was not, most of the stuff was destroyed. They, they wanted no part of it because it was not an honorable thing. Yes, sir? In pretty much all of the wars, you've had snipers or marksmen, whatever you want to call them. Right. In the Revolutionary War, there's one incident where one of them got set out to shoot down an officer name was Murphy. I can't remember who the officer was. It, it, and uh, it wasn't an honorable thing. You weren't supposed to kill the officer. 
Correct. Correct. And that was that again. That was that was primarily the targets. That's who these guys were set after. Yes, sir. You had a question. From everything that I've read, now this is just my interpretation from what I've read. There was no corporal, captain, sergeant, there was nothing. You were just a sharpshooter, period. That's it. And I do know that you worked hard to maintain that. After you got it, you could lose it, you know? If you failed on your, your, your tests and stuff when you went out to shoot, if you failed, you got sent back, and then you were doing camp duty and all of that stuff. So you did your best to stay right there on the edge, and, and that, was their, that was their duty. That's what they wanted. Yes, sir? So when you used like the two-gain infield, did they up the total charges in it, or did you use the standard charge? Speculation on my part is they would, because when they tested the infields, you know, they always tested them on the heavy side. Um, I can't, I can't give you a 100% guarantee that they did or they didn't because that's never, that's never been anything that I've come across as far as, as the documentation and the, and the charges. And uh, as, as they say today, look kids, don't try this at home because, you know, I mean, if, if I know that it's incredibly windy and I gotta make a 900 yard shot, and I've shot that rifle enough to know that 65 grains ain't going to cut it. I'm going to push it. You know, what am I going to lose? Another thing was that sniping and sharpshooting being unpopular. Uh, the armies in recent years, like from the Spanish-American, the First World War and the Second World War, they ended up developing these sniping units, and after the wars were over, they abandoned them. Right. When we went into Vietnam, they had to start from scratch. Right, and this is this is this is uh, this is why my history teacher told me those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So therefore, <laughs> we'll lesson learned. We keep the special forces intact. You know, it's easier to have them and not need them than it is to need them and not have it. And this is this is the this is the thing that that what happened in the Civil War with this particular bunch was a precursor to the development of the modern day special forces that we see today. It was just a natural progression and development. Now, have they faltered in some ways and stopped? Yes, they have. But when I sit back and I look at some of the elitists like, you know, the SEAL teams and some of the Green Berets and some of the other things that, that uh, and I'm sure they've got groups out there that as a normal American citizen we don't even know about, these guys are so well trained and the equipment that they have is so advanced that I, I'm pretty confident that if the need was to be made, there is a soldier trained out there that could do the job. And that's what, that's kind of the way these guys were. They were, when they were called upon, they were expected to produce, and most of them did. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Right. Because it wasn't a hollow base. Correct. With the blockade, it must have been really difficult getting bullets. The only thing I can speak to on this, this is what I do know from what I've read, the Whitworth was purchased, every Whitworth that the Confederacy purchased was purchased in Confederate gold. Okay, it wasn't, it wasn't in cash, it was paid for in gold. 
The Whitworth itself came with 500 rounds of ammunition. But, and that's the crucial but, that eight inch piece that was cut off of that barrel was the mold that went to match the slugs for that gun. So after you ran those 800, or after you ran those 500 rounds out, now you're on your own. And the, the, the British had been making things for so long that their powder and their lead was probably a little bit better grade than what the Confederate forces could get their hands on. Hence, that's why the Whitworth became such a problem. And it would foul, and it would foul quickly. It did not, it did not take long for them to find out. And these guys, when they were loading that, most of them could hide behind a tree and load it. The Whitworth itself, you were screwing that slug down in that barrel with that ramrod to get it to go all the way down. It was not a start it with a starter and, you know, take it down. It would take them over a minute and a half sometimes to get that slug down inside that. That's why, that's why when, when people say, oh, the Whitworth was the greatest rifle. Yes, it's a great weapon. But it was a weapon that they used for specific purposes. It wasn't the everyday, it wasn't their everyday, you know, I mean, the, if you needed a tank today, you'd call in a tank. That's kind of what this is. You call up on the phone and you tell the general you need a tank set over for some cover, and that's what, that's kind of what this would be. Yeah? Yep, the, um, the, right, uh, I read a story, and it can't be confirmed, I, I, I cannot confirm this, I read it, I haven't read it anyplace else, but some of the Confederate sharpshooters would do a thing that they call ringing the battery. These guys would set out at about 400 yards, and they would shoot the left and the right side wheels on those cannons just to let the gunners know that they're within their range. <laughs> Maybe they ought to move. <coughs> I can't confirm that that's true. I only read it in one source. Sounds like something they would do, though. You know, it really does. It sounds like something they would do. But that, again, factual part, I can't say that's factual. For comedy relief, I can say, yeah, they did that because it sounds like something funny that, that they would do. But there has been, and I can find, no actual documentation outside of, of that one piece that said that that was ever done. Uh, do I know that the least desirable job for firing cannons was the guy that carried the little punk stick that glowed red? Yeah, that was the least desirable job because you know what? That little glowing red ember made him the world's best target for any of those guys up there in the trees. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, for a very informational and uh, interesting topic. <laughs> Is there anything else that should be come forward at the meeting here? Can I give you the money for this? Otherwise, I would ask for a motion for adjournment. All those in favor of...